Great, great, I will. Hello everyone and welcome to Charleston Antique Mall. Thank you for joining us for our last class of our 2024 free class series. We are gonna welcome Mary Blake, who is our residential historian. She's gonna teach us all about Nevada, ghost towns and mining towns. So we thank you guys for joining us. We ask that any dealers, please turn off your walkies. And if you guys could silence your cell phones, we'd appreciate it. If you've missed any of our past classes, they're all available up on our YouTube channel for free. We've had this year's and last year's. We have a full series from last year. And also check out our Instagram. We do uh, weekly story sales every Thursday. We have items for sale and they're all shippable. So check us out on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We have a uh, YouTube page and we also have our website page, which has all the information about upcoming events and things like that. So thank you for joining us. And once again, welcome to our Nevada Ghost and Mining Town. Thank you. I must tell you, I'm the walk walking wounded today. I broke a, f a bone in my foot, so if I have to sit down, I apologize. I'm going to try to stand up. Um, I am Mary Blake. This is my husband, Don. I am a descendant of a ghost town, and he's a Nevada miner, so we're going to share our knowledge with you. Uh, yesterday was Nevada Day, and Thursday is Halloween, so it's pretty appropriate we're appropriate. We're going to talk about Nevada history and we're going to talk about ghosts, towns. Anyway, um, why, why does Nevada have so many ghost towns? And how many ghost towns are there? Any ideas? What would you think? A hundred maybe? 600 is exactly right. According, <laughs> she's read the book. According to Stanley Payer, there are 600 ghost towns in Nevada. It's kind of unusual, uh, but towns in Nevada are kind of unusual, and mining in Nevada is kind of unusual. Uh, let me give you some a little scenario of how towns are made in the, in the history of Nevada. Let's say there's a prospector, and maybe he's got a borough, maybe he's got a friend, and they're out in the middle of the Nevada, and they come across, they're out here in the desert, they come across an unusual rock and they pick it up, take it in and have it assay. The assayer says, oh my God, this is silver and it's worth a lot of money. Prospector goes back out to his claim and makes sure he's got it claimed. But you know what? In those days, nothing was a secret. So as soon as per people heard, oh my gosh, there's silver right here, everybody started coming to see if they could find silver there. Now the prospector either opens a mine or he sells his prospect to a mining company. They hire people to come and work in the mine and in the mill. And those people need services and merchandise. So now here come all the storekeepers and the town grows like a boom. It's not like an ordinary town that, you know, just kind of grows along, but this town booms. Pretty soon there's a thousand people out here in the middle of the desert and they're all working and depending on that mine. But we know what happens to mines because <coughs> mines depend on ore and eventually the ore goes away or it becomes too expensive to mine and the mine closes, and the mine closes, the miners leave, the prospectors leave, and pretty soon everybody's gone and the town is abandoned, and that's a Nevada ghost town. In Nevada, there's two kinds of ghost towns. There's ghost towns, and then there's living ghost towns. And the living ghost towns, not everybody left, and they're still there, like in Pioch. <laughs> we have someone from Pioch here. <laughs> anyway, I, I have a map here of Nevada, and on here I've put some of the sites that we have visited that we think are interesting enough for you to visit. 
if you want to see a true ghost town where there's nobody there, there is a Nevada State Park in Berlin. It's called Berlin, Nevada. And it's right up here. <coughs> and Berlin, Nevada was a company town. So it's not a typical boom to bust town. The company had about 300 miners there. But the reason Berlin is important is because they preserved the town until 1971, even though there was no one there. And in 1971, they gave it to the state for a state park. So the buildings are there. Most of your ghost towns that have been abandoned have either disappeared because of the elements, a hundred years out in the desert, or because of vandals. People go to, van go to ghost towns and vandalize them. But Berlin, you can see what a ghost town really looked like. And it was uh, abandoned, I think, in 1899. So it was a long time ago. The other ghost town that I think people would like to see is Bodie. Bodie is not in Nevada. Bodie's in California. But Bodie was a real boom town. In fact, I think in, I'm trying to think what year, in 19, 1900, they had 65 saloons. So you know how big Bodie was. And then by 1900, the town was abandoned. Luckily, a man came along named Mr. Sima, and he bought the town. And his family had preserved the town until they gave it to the state of California for a state park. And I know you've been to Bodie. Anybody else been to Bodie? Oh, great. So you know it's a fabulous ghost town. Sadly, two years ago, uh, in the California legislature, they proposed closing Bodie. And uh, luckily, it didn't work. <laughs> the public uh, came, came to the rescue of Bodie. All right, so those are ghost towns. But I like living ghost towns because the people are there, they can tell you about the towns, and the buildings are preserved. So let me tell you about some of my favorite living ghost towns. Uh, one of them is Pioche. And Pioche is over here. Pioch was uh, known as the roughest ghost, or roughest mining camp in Nevada. In fact, they say that 72 people died violently before one person had a natural death. So you know it was bad. And if you're into ghosts, I would imagine that cemetery's got some ghosts of those 72 people in it. But because it's a living ghost town, the buildings are still there. They're being used. You can get food there. You can stay overnight there. It's a fabulous living ghost town. Another one of my favorites is Austin. Austin is a dear little town. It was a gold camp um, in the 1800s. Today in Austin, they have, I believe, 15 houses or buildings on the National Historic Register. They have a great museum there. Um, Stokes Castle is there. It was funny, these mining magnets, when they'd make a lot of money, love to build castles. And oh, there's a castle there. Um, if you are going from Vegas up to Reno, you pass through two of my favorite living ghost towns. First one you come to is Goldfield. And Goldfield, let me get the date. I'm sorry, I can't remember dates. Um, 1860 was Austin. 1902. Now we had go, uh, we had mining in Nevada in the 1800s, and then we had another boom in the 1900s. So in 1902, they found gold in Goldfield, and Goldfield became the largest city in Nevada when it was booming. There were 20,000 people living in Goldfield, and that was in 1902. Now, about 1912, 10 years later, because of fires and floods and the, and the ore, it went down to 10. So it went from 20,000 to 
10. Amazing, but very typical of Nevada mining camps. In Goldfield, uh, the first weekend of August, they have Goldfield Days. And if you want to go and have a good time, you can go for Goldfield Days. They open up some of the historic buildings that are there, and they do talk on, on the history of Goldfield. Um, there's a hotel there if you're into ghosts, and it was built by George Wingfield. It's a beautiful hotel. And uh, <laughs> supposedly, if you're in the hotel, he walks the halls, and you know he's coming because you can smell his cigar, cigar smoke, and you'll see the ashes left on the floor. A little bit up the road from Goldfield is Tonopah. How many of you have been to Tonopah? Well, if you're going to Reno, you'd go through it. Anyway, Tonopah is another, good, Tonopah is another living ghost town. It's the capital of Nye County, so of course there are more people there. Uh, in 1905, there were 10,000 residents in Tonopah, and it was the richest silver producer in the United States. And within five years, the, the uh, population had dropped significantly. Today, there's about 1,500 people there. Uh, the good thing about Tonopah is it has a mining, outdoor mining museum that is better than any you'll see anywhere. It also has the Mizpah Hotel where you can stay, the historic Mizpah. And the Mizpah has my favorite ghost story. Uh, on the fifth floor of the Mizpah Hotel in the early days, there was a lady of the evening, supposedly named Rose, and Rose had a suite of rooms decorated to the nines because she had a lot of money and she loved fancy things. And Rose lived there and one evening when Rose came out of her room, was walking in the hall, supposedly a jealous lover attacked her, stabbed her, killed her, and broke the beautiful pearl necklace that she was wearing so the pearls rolled all over the floor. Now today, if you stay in one of those rooms, they say, you can smell her perfume, you can hear her walking in her beautiful red gown. Louder? Yes. Oh, sorry, Steve. Uh, anyway, this is a scary story, so I don't want to get too loud. <laughs> anyway, uh, and under your pillow, you may find a pearl. And the lady, of, lady in red has visited the fifth floor. So that's a ghost you can see there. But as you get up to Reno, you get to the star of living ghost towns, which is Virginia City. Virginia City is an amazing place. In 1859, they discovered the biggest load of silver that was ever found. And the riches from the gold rush in California, those people headed over to Nevada. And it was called the Comstock Load. Now, historically to Nevada, this is a big deal because this is at the time of the Civil War. And in Washington, D.C., President Lincoln was up for re-election. And he wasn't sure he was going to make it. And he needed money and silver for his war that was going on. So he petitioned the governor of the Nevada Territory. And he said, you know what? If we make Nevada a state, that would be good for the nation. Even though Nevada had not even close to the number of people required to become a state. So Nevada Territory messed around, messed around, messed around for about six months. And they finally came up with a state constitution, which had to be sent to Washington, D.C. to be approved by Congress. And uh, by the time they'd figured out the Constitution, they didn't have much time left. They had to get it there before Election Day in November. And the only way to get it there was by telegraph. So they telegraphed the entire Constitution to Washington, D.C. And it was approved, and Nevada became a state on October 31st. That's why it's Halloween, not because Nevada has ghost towns or anything. But anyway, 
<laughs> and then the people of Nevada were able to vote in the presidential election, and President Lincoln was reelected. But back to Virginia City. Virginia City was called the Queen of the West. San Francisco was great, but Virginia City tried to outdo San Francisco with elaborate buildings, um, opera houses, a fabulous newspa newspaper that hired Mark Twain as one of the reporters. And um, what's interesting is this bottle is from Virginia, Nevada. And that is before Virginia became Virginia City, because it started, like all little towns, as just a little town. But when it got big, of course, it became Virginia City. And Virginia City had a population of about 25,000 people and was amazing. The mine was amazing. Don, do you want to tell them anything about the mine? The well, there's a, a pair of boys coming west um, to gold, to, to work in the gold fields in California, stumbled across a ledge of white metal in Nevada. They didn't know whether they were in Nevada or California. There was no signs, no fences, no roads. But they were, they were the Grolsch brothers, and they were credited with finding that and they just played around there. And uh, this is 1859, 10 years after the rush in California. So the, the word got out that that dirty gray rock was silvered and boom, it became a boom town. And they, they made or, or, or railroad cards full of silver. They had silver for everything. They had a silver we went up there at the Mackey Man. One of the big guys there was Mr. Mackey. I went to Mackey School of Mines at Reno. And uh, they made so much silver that they used silver for things that you wouldn't you if they had silver plates instead of pottery or porcelain or something. They had silver, silver, silver. You can't imagine. So they built everything. They, the first fifth uh, five-story school in 1860 in Carson City, uh, Virginia City. It's, it's, build, it's as big as one of our hotel on the Strip, a school. Um, so anyway, it was magnificent. Everybody in the world knew there. They got all their food fresh from San Francisco daily, back and forth, back and forth. They tried to outdo Paris and, uh, because every, there, there was the big four uh, if I name it, we, we, uh, they tried to outdo one another. And they also went, put that money that they got and went back to San Francisco and built San Francisco up. Now, that sounds great, right? But we know the history of mining in Nevada. What do you think happened? Yes, well, the big mine was underground and also underground was the heat. And so the poor miners who were trying to work down there couldn't work because it was so hot. And they worked and worked and worked and tried to figure out how they could make it not so hot down there, but guess what? They never were able to do that. And so by 1890, 1860, 1890, the mine was not operating. And you know what happened? Everybody started to leave. By 1900, there were probably 500 people left in the fabulous city of Virginia City. And from then on, nothing, rec nothing recovered until about 1950. And you know what happened in 1950? Tourism became a big deal in the state of Nevada. And Virginia City is about the fourth most visited outside of the casinos in Nevada because it's such a wonderful site. It is uh, on the National Historic Register. It is not protected by the state, but it is protected by the people who live there and take care of it. You have to go. You have to take the museum tours. You have to go through the wonderful mansions that are there. You have to go through the schoolhouse. It is a fabulous place to visit. 
In contrast to that, you come back down to rhyolite, and I know there were people here who said they had been to rhyolite. Uh, rhyolite's one of my favorite places to go. But it, the story of rhyolite is totally incredible because in uh, 1905, two prospectors discovered not just gold, but a fabulous uh, vein of gold in a rhyolite, rhyolites of rock. That's how it got its name. And it was so rich that it blossomed all over the United States. Everybody heard of rhyolite and everybody came. So by, from two people in 1905, 1907, there were 5,000 people in rhyolite. And what happened was Charles Schwab, you've probably heard of him, the investor, he heard about this and he had a, an inkling that, wow, I could make some money here. So he bought the mine, and then he decided to build the most modern city in Rhyolite, and it would be a showpiece and everybody would come. It would be like San Francisco or something. So the new city that he built not only had electric lights, it had telephones. It had cement sidewalks. He encouraged all of the investors and uh, the, my, uh, the banking people, they came to Rhyolite. They built these magnificent buildings, not out of wood like most of the towns were built of, but out of brick and mortar. And they would last forever. And the town would last forever. And then a really weird thing happened. In San Francisco, the earthquake happened. And when that happened, the stock exchange got all mixed up. And so what he was counting on was the stock exchange to keep his town going, and now that didn't work. And the stock in the mine that he owned went from $23 a share to $0.75 cents a share. And then the people started thinking, well, it's okay because the mine will recover, but maybe we should investigate the mine and see how much is in the mine. And when they did that, they found out that the mine had been overvalued a lot. And that very rich vein didn't last very far. There was gold there, but that rich vein wasn't very big. So the mine was busted. He closed the mine. And guess what? Everybody left. And from 1907 to 1920, the town diminished in size. And the 1920 census, there were 14 people in Rhyolite. <coughs> the buildings were still there because they were good permanent buildings, but everybody was gone. And today the desert has taken a lot of its wrath out on the buildings. Buildings are falling down, but they're still there and they're beautiful. There's a wonderful depot there. There were three railroads servicing Rhyolite, three, so they had a big depot. Um, they built a lot of houses out of bottles because that was a good material. So there's a wonderful bottle house there. You can walk the main street of Rhyolite and see where the buildings were. They have signage and uh, they're kind of protecting Rhyolite. It belongs to the Bureau of Land Management. So that means there is no ranger on, on, uh, on site. What, what is your memory of Rhyolite? Well, the train station had a big fence around it. They couldn't get in and look at the train station. But I think the thing that impressed me the most was the sage that's still standing there in the bank. They yeah. Stand on the road and see. It's a massive sage, probably about the size of that black curtain. Yeah. And it's still sitting there. The first time we went up, we had to walk up to the buildings. Now they have barbed wire along the street asking you to stay out of buildings. And I understand that. Because even though most people don't take anything, some people do. And um, they vandalize. They they break things. They paint things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a book up here uh, on Rhyolite, the boom years, and that's a great one to read because it tells you how fabulous Rhyolite was. That belongs to Jamie, and she's got it for sale. She has a lot of the books up here. Uh, and they are for sale. Uh, there you can see sort of the town. Today, 
the only buildings that are left are the big um, brick and mortar buildings that are there. I was reading through the book and it talks about the swimming pool, the public swimming pool. You had to pay to get in, but they had a big swimming pool. And uh, when you paid your money, they gave you a bathing suit. <laughs> anyway, so that that's Rhyolite. There's a an outdoor art uh, display in Rhyolite. It's not that far away. You go to Beatty, and it's off the road from Beatty. How far, Don? Beatty's about 90 miles, and Rhyolite's about eight miles outside of Beatty. So maybe an hour and a half. And e easy, you drive up and back in one day. Now, I told you that I'm a descendant of a um, mining camp uh, person, boom person. In 1915, my great-grandfather, Philip McClanahan, was living in Missouri and working in a lead mine there. And he heard how, how these people without TVs and everything heard about all this stuff, I don't know. But he heard about this boom in southern Nevada, which was the largest lead and zinc mine was located there and they were hiring so he loaded up the family um, his three daughters his two sons sold the farm and got on the train and got off the train at gene and went up the hill to good springs um, at that time good springs was a boom town and it had uh, a two-story hotel. All boom towns had a hotel that was better than any other hotel. It had uh, three big mercantile stores. It had uh, a Ford agency that sold more cars, twice as many cars, as the nearest agency, which was in Las Vegas. Uh, it had a movie theater, and uh, it didn't have a laundry. So my great-grandfather opened a laundry, and the women went to work in the laundry, and the men went to work in the mine and prospected in the area. The Yellow Pine Mine had a train that went from the mine to Jean, met the big train. Um, it was a fabulous, booming community. Most of the ore was used in World War I for the war effort. They needed bombs, they needed bullets, and they needed batteries. And lead and zinc are the minerals that they used. So everything was great until World War I ended. And when World War I ended, then it was kind of like, what do we do with this stuff? And by 1930, the Yellow Pine Mine shut down. They tore up the railroad, took it away, and the 2,000 people that had lived in that area left, most of them. About 200 of them remained. And they stayed because they could find work at the dam in 1936. And it wasn't too far to get back to Good Springs and your family. They also could get to Vegas pretty easy, and there was work in Vegas. So that's why they didn't all leave Good Springs. But today, if you go to Good Springs, the only business is the Pioneer Saloon. How many of you have been to the Pioneer? Wow. Oh, fabulous. It's a fabulous place. You have to go. And uh, in November, they're having a Fallout. If you've heard of Fallout, Fallout is a game. Fallout is a movie. And it's a convention from around the world of Fallout visitors. And last year, I think they had like 10,000 people there. So you might want to go out to Good Springs and see the fallout people. Um, they, Good Springs still has its original school built in 1913. Still has kids come to school every day. I think there's about six or seven of them. Every day they ring the bell, the kids line up in front of the school, say the pledge, and go into school. One room schoolhouse. Uh, it is part of the Clark County School District, so they have a teacher from Clark County. Um, I did have here, which I passed around earlier, um, the Yellow Pine Mine. This is from the museum. There is a museum in Good Springs. And it shows you the underground workings, just so you can see what those mines in those early 
camps looked like. Don says it's 26 miles long and you can see all the shafts. Unfortunately, it was shored up with wood and after a hundred years, the wood is gone. So you do not want to walk through any of the early mines because they will collapse on you. But this is what it looked like in. This is the train. And this is the big mill that was in Good Springs, which unfortunately burned three times. And the last time it burned, they said, that's it. We're not rebuilding it. Anyway, Don being a miner, he came to Good Springs for a copper mine in about 1960. And I met him there and we got married and we have nurtured our love for Nevada mining camps and towns since then. We've collected a lot of stuff, and Don is the expert on this stuff, except for one thing. This is a picture of my mother and my grandfather. I told you my great-grandfather came from Missouri, and remember he opened the laundry where the girls were working? My grandfather came from the gold country, Grass Valley. He was there to prospect. And he went in the laundry, met my mom, fell in love, and they got married. And in 1919, my mom was born in Good Springs. And uh, the burrow that she's sitting on was part of my great uncle's pack team that went up to the copper mines on Mount Potosi. Uh, my grandfather learned real fast that the miners didn't make a lot of money. So he became a merchant. He opened an ice cream store and a general mercantile in Good Springs. And uh, that's my family. Okay, Don. Okay. Um, Tell them about the pick first. That's my favorite story. The um, Mary's people, the, they, they were miners in, in Missouri, and that was her mother's side. Their father's side was a miner in the Grass Valley, Nevada City, part of the gold, the gold, the Golden Trail and the uh, Miners 49, the Gold Rush. Well, a gentleman, uh, the, the people that discovered the gold at Sutter's Mill in California, uh, that's what started it. They, they followed it, and it's a it's a geologic trail that has gold where the earth uh, had a, uh, what's called a, a uh, I escaped Where me. did you find that? But anyway, this thing came uh, with them. They, did, they didn't, they were too late for the boom of uh, 49. So they came to Vegas and they heard about it. And that's how this came down. Now this was a part, this ties into um, Virginia City. Virginia City had all this silver, but they didn't have any uh, place to get shovels, uh, equipment. So somebody in San Francisco, they, everything they got was, had to come overland from San Francisco for the miners to use those big machines and all that. Well, somebody got an idea and they built their own foundry in Virginia City. And Virginia City was called the Washoe. It's an Indian word. And this pick was made around probably 1850 in Virginia City. Got the, the date, I mean, the name stamped on it, Warshow. Her grandfather brought it to Good Springs, and that's how I got it. But it, this is like a museum piece dating back to the gold rush of 49 in California. Now, uh, this thing here, you've probably all seen these in one form or another. This is a carbide lamp. What is carbide? Carbide is a mineral that you unscrew the base, you put the carbide, it comes in a five gallon tin. You put the, the this is, well anyway, put the uh, carbide in here. This is a water reservoir. You put the water in there, and then this little lever, you drip the water into the carbide and it produces methane gas comes out here because there was no power so this was their underground 
illumination, and they hung that. Where's our? I don't know. I don't see it here. Anyway, there was. We have a. All of them had uh, hand forged objects that you nailed into the wall underground. You hung this on that, and this light provided you with light to work underground. So that's a pretty amazing little piece of goods. There's hundreds of different types of these, basically all over, not, not special in Nevada. Um, but, but these are very highly collectible because there's such a variety of, them, variety of them. And if you go around the mall here, I think you'll find more than one of these in some of the booths because they're, they're so cool to sit on a shelf, but there are people who collect them because of the different companies that make them. Okay, next I'll give you an, a typical day in the life of a hard rock miner. I worked a hard rock miner for 11 years underground. Um, we would, we would uh, we, we, my father moved to Vegas because he was a gold bug and we prospected all over uh, Good Springs. We found a little property, we bought it, we started mining. So we would get up on, uh, actually it was Sunday night, we would drive out to our prospect mine and we would settle in. Uh, we, we started with a tent and we built it up to a cabin. Um, we got our, now here's one you might not think about. There's no, there's no water in the desert where the mines are. So what do you do with your clothes? So we would go to Goodwill over the weekend and buy a pair of Levi's for a quarter, a, a white business shirt uh, for a dime. And we wore those all week and then we had to throw them away because there's no water to wash and they get fish oil in them. What's fish oil? Fish oil is what keeps the jackhammer lubricated. You can't get it out of clothing. So anyway, we we leave here, we get our supplies at the 20th century supermarket. Maybe it wasn't the 20th. And out we'd head Sunday night. Monday morning, we'd get up and we'd go up to the mine and we'd start working. We had a couple of people working with us. And uh, I would stop down by the Showboat Hotel, which wasn't there then, but it was Boyles Brothers Hardware. And I would buy a case of dynamite for 18 bucks and a can of uh, blasting caps packed in sawdust. This was about three and a half dollars. This is 1961, 50 maybe. And there's your caps, three and a half dollars. Case dynamite is 18, and uh, the fuse was three and a half. You got to roll a fuse about that big. So we would go up to the mine, and hopefully everything was not damaged by tourists. But uh, we all did our jobs. Uh, I was the powder monkey, so I I would go into the face of the how far the last blast had taken me, and I would put in, I'd set my, we get the, we get the uh, compressor going, that was a big deal on Monday morning to get the compressor going. The compressor gave us the air to run the jackhammer. Jackhammers run on air. I'd get to the end, I had to make five or five or six cuts with a jackhammer to put the stick the dynamite in the holes. The first one's called the uh, the back. Uh, there was a cut up, two cuts at the face, two cuts at the base, one cup at the top, and one cut, which means drill holes that I use with a jackhammer. Then you light them in, in order, and the lifter is the one on the bottom, and that kind of breaks it all up. Then you yell, uh, fire in the hole, <coughs> make sure everybody's out. And you use a piece of hose, oh, you, you take the stick of dynamite and you, uh, there's a special plier, so you cut your hose, your fuse, you put your uh, that cap on it, you squeeze it, you stick it in the stick of dynamite and you uh, work it back. Uh, so if this is a stick of dynamite, the cap and fuse goes in here and then it comes out here in the hook fuse sticks out the end of the hole. You tamp that in there. Now you have a piece of fuse 
called a spitter, and the spitter's got knife cuts every um, six inches, and so you have six or eight few, uh, what they call fuses and cuts and sticks, and you light those in order with that when it ever comes to that knife cut on the fuse, it sparkles out, and that lights the other fuses that are on the wall in front of you. So anyway, I, I just saw, I hadn't done that before. I'm a little bit shaky on it, but that was <laughs> that was in, and then that's it. You, everybody's out, and you count your blasts. You know how many you had, and if you don't hear one, you're in big trouble. <laughs> I mean, I had to go back in if there was one. We just put one in behind it, blow it. We don't ever try to dig it out. And that usually, we're still here, so I got and away. You notice with... I didn't let him bring uh, dynamite or fuses oh. or any of that dangerous stuff. Um, another thing that you might not have thought about. Oh, so her grandfather, he set his sister up in a confectionery and she operated the first lending library. Why? Because they don't have television, they don't have the power, they can't do anything at night after the miners get off shift. So they would go to Great Aunt Rose, get a book, give her a dime. They didn't have a dime. They'd give her a nickel, which was, they didn't have any coins or banks or anything. So they, her grandfather and the other merchants produce tokens, and the token says, Otto F. Schwartz, Mercantile, General Mercantile, Good Springs, Nevada, and on this side it says, good for five cents in trade. So they didn't have money. The money was all held by the, 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 like the owner or the foreman of the mine. They didn't pay him in money. They gave him uh, maybe gold, uh, but this was changed. Nobody had any change. So in the library, she ran this thing. They pick up the book. They bring it back the next week. She gives them a nickel, and they get another book. And amazing the books that they were reading. They were reading the classics. And the print in those books is like this. I don't know how they did it, but I still have some of the books that she used in the lending library. How about this, Don? Um, this is a very cute uh, tobacco tin. But what the miners used it for was a lunch pail. I can remember my grandmother packing it for my great uncles when they'd go up to the mine and they would take, a, take their lunch in a lunch pail like this. Uh, I think over there is a crucible which was used to melt the ore. Uh, you'll see two photographs over there. Those are of Good Springs. Why do you go to ghost towns now? Well, you go, if, the, if it's a living ghost town, you go there to hear what the history was, but also to take photographs. It's the most beautiful, they're the most beautiful places to go. And Don, if you can grab the one behind, the one in front is called the Cottonwood Cabin in Good Springs, and it's from about 1905, the one on down, the black and white. This is the oldest building in Clark County made of stone and it is in Good Springs and it's still standing. There were a lot earlier, but they're not standing, but this one is in Good Springs, it's still standing. Um, do you have any questions about ghost towns or anything I haven't covered about a ghost town that you might like to know? <coughs> I was just gonna say in Piot, my, my parents were there and they came through Las Vegas. Las, there was nothing in Las Vegas. It was just a dirt road. They lived in Pioche, and my father owned a hospital there. And he treated the patients through the front door and all the animals in the back. Wow. Through the back door. And he drove the ambulance and took care of all the miners and everything. But, and a lot of the people, like Pete Fedley, Osmobile, and all those people, and the people that opened the banks and everything, in Las Vegas came from Piotr. Piotr is about 173 miles from uh, from Las Vegas. But Las Vegas was nothing. He said there was one telephone on a pole on Main Street, and that was it. There was no Las Vegas. Well, Piotr and was huge, you know was big. There were you know there were lots of people in Piotr, but it was a big <coughs> mining town. But Piotr was the cap or the capital of the county 
until Clark County was created. Oh, yeah. So if you were in Good Springs and you needed to file your claim, you had to go to Pioch. Right. And if you want to look at the records of the early claims in Southern Nevada, you have to go to Pioch to and find them. there's a million dollar courthouse there also that's still standing. And my and father's first hostel burned down because it was built of wood and then he built the second one that's still standing and it's on in Main Street and it's built of concrete. But yeah. there is, there's a, right now there's about 800, 900 people that live there. About two years ago, they about lost the whole town because there was a fire on three sides of the town. Wow. But it, it's still there. What's uh, also interesting about the courthouse, it was only supposed to cost $25,000. But by the time it was built, it cost a million dollars. And I don't think they ever really used it very much. It's blocked. It's not open now, right? Well, no, they, you can. Oh, can you go in there? <laughs> At what time of the day you're there? You can go in there. Anyway. Yeah. And uh, they do have the museum and they have other things. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting town. It's a great town to go and visit. And it's in a beautiful, beautiful part of the state. Um, Another Anybody item. Want to say anything? Oh, I'm sorry. What you got? Maybe say, a can. Oh, what, is there something in the can? Why would they be carrying their lunch in this can? Well, and when you're working in the mines, there's no smoking, so inside the can was chewing tobacco. Oh. So when they ran out, when they emptied, then they used it to keep the dust and mire out of their lunch, and the lunch would be usually from, in Good Springs, there were a lot of Cornish miners from England, and they used a type of pastry called a pasty, which was stew and a pie crust made into a hold in your hand. Today they call them wraps, but they could eat it clean, no problem. That's why those little Things are prevalent all over the Western mining camps. Um, if you are interested in going um, out into the desert to find uh, mining camps and ghost towns, this is a great book. It's by Stanley Payer. Um, it's an atlas, so um, it actually shows you on a map where where they're located. It shows you what should be there, could be there. <laughs> depending on if anybody's come through and already taken it. Um, great, a great resource. A great book is Nevada Mining Camps and Ghost Towns uh, by Stanley Payer. He goes through the history of all the towns. It's a, a great source. Uh, you can look online. A lot of people have made YouTubes of the ghost towns, so you can just go on, look up Goldfield, and you'll find YouTubes of people have made of, of uh, Goldfield. Goldfield's got some great YouTubes. Um, anything else? Anybody want to tell us a ghost story uh, <laughs> since it's a ghost town? I told you my favorite, the lady in red, George Wingfield. There's a great one about the Warshoe Club in uh, Virginia City. There's Too off color to, to share. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, most of these towns have great stories. The Good Springs story is, of course, the, the miner who was killed in a gunfight over a card game. And he still haunts the Pioneer, I guess. The bullet holes are still in the wall at the Pioneer Saloon. That's a big draw. Uh, big draw. A, a draw. A big draw. Oh, yes, that's true. Uh, Skip just reminded me, uh, uh, Clark Gable sat in the Pioneer, Hope, uh, Pioneer Saloon waiting for news about his wife, Carol Lombard, who crashed on Mount Potosi. And part of the story for my family is that because my great uncles owned the mine on Mo Mount Potosi, they were the people who led the army up to the crash site. They didn't know how to get there because there were no roads, of course, and it was a burrow trail that they went up to find the wreckage of the plane. So yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Yes, that? yes. CBS has the uh, Outdoor Nevada that he takes you to a lot of these places and inside the old hotels and they talk about the ghosts and they talk about the 
mining and gives you a little bit of an insight of what is out there in Nevada. They do an excellent job. That's a great series, uh, Outdoor Nevada on Channel 10. Oh, um, yeah, Channel 10. And you know what? Uh, the whole story of these communities that boomed and died is crazy because you go anywhere else in the United States, you don't see that. You don't see a town of 20,000 people gone in four or five years. It's just, just Nevada, Nevada history. Anything else? I thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for coming. Come on up. Take a look. Uh, talk to Don. He's got more stories.